Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Just another rainy day here in Southeast Oklahoma. Now we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and we've now come to the 10th chapter of this marvelous epistle. I'd like to begin by reading from the 17th chapter of John, the first six verses, John 17, one through six. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me and they have kept thy word. Our Father and our God, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the privilege and for the opportunity that we have to feast upon your word. May we approach this as the word of the sovereign living God. And may the Holy Spirit be the one who filters out the error and the foolishness that comes from this channel, but seal to our hearts that which is truth so that we grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name I pray, amen. Now in our last study together, we had finished chapter nine in the eighth chapter of Romans, we began to be introduced to the grand subject of God's sovereignty. And we found that it is through him, through Christ, that all things work together for our good, that he predestined us, he predetermined us, he called us, he justified us, he glorified us. And he did this all by his sovereign act. Nobody can lay any charge against us, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we will see that in chapters 9, 10, and 11, a great, uh, treatment, uh, a great discussion of that sovereignty of God. We ended the ninth chapter. Well, what do we say about the Gentiles, they inherited righteousness, but Israel did not attain righteousness. They didn't attain it because they sought it by works of law. They in fact stumbled at the stumbling stone, and I pointed out that the stumbling stone is Jesus, none other than Jesus Christ. And prophetically, it was pointed out that they would stumble. In fact, the Holy Spirit quotes text to show that they were going to stumble at the stumbling stone. If they hadn't done that, the prophetic word would not have been true. Now we're not looking at Paul's reasoning or Paul's logic. You've heard me talk about that and point, point that fact out numerous times, going back as far back as the beginning of the, the first video that I did on Ephesians. This is not Paul's logic, not his reasoning that we're looking at. Beginning chapter 10, you can find commentary after commentary that tries to delve into Paul's mind, Paul's logic, Paul's reasoning. Paul, folks, is not the author. We're not looking at the striving of, of some human theologian trying to figure out what Paul ought to say. 
This is God's word. And if nothing else, I want you to approach this as God's word. This is, this is not Paul's word. Paul's reasoning or Paul's logic. I can't imagine how many articles that I've read that, that discuss the different theology between John and Paul or, or Matthew and Paul or Peter and Paul. This is God's word and the author is the almighty eternal God. I, I want you to see that in verse one of chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, yes, Paul wrote that, but the author is the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Holy Spirit's desire is the Holy Spirit's heart's desire is that Israel might be saved. I've mentioned on numerous occasions how that the word saved is often taken as, as meaning redemption or Christians today will take that word saved and they'll, they'll encompass all of the rest into it, justified, sanctified, glorified. It's all, it all means saved. Folks, these words are not synonyms. Do we have the right to do that? God predestinated and those whom he predestinated, he called and those whom he called, he justified and those whom he justified, he glorified. Now, did he do that or did he not? Is he in the process of doing that? And is that process something that we should call salvation? Timothy, take heed to doctrine for in so doing, thou shalt redeem thyself. No, thou shalt save thyself. And then that hear thee. It's not doctrine that justifies you. You are made righteous by the obedience of Jesus Christ, by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. We were clearly told in this epistle that the elect were made sinners by Adam and made righteous by Christ. Now, should we just throw that, that verse out, those verses out? Verse one, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Is the Holy Spirit anxiously concerned that non-righteous people be saved? That God predestinated, that he called, he justified, he glorified, he did that. But my heart's desire is that I go beyond that and get some others. I mean, am I to, to conclude from this verse that the Holy Spirit is asking Paul to say that there are some Israelites who are not yet made righteous, who are not redeemed, and I want them to be redeemed. But that's what many theologians try to tell me. And in fact, most commentaries will tell you that. How am I made righteous? How am I made righteous? By the obedience of Christ. You have no other scripture. You have no possibility of approaching this book and saying that your righteousness is dependent in any way on anything you do. So he is not praying in this verse. His great desire in this verse is that unredeemed people would become redeemed that unrighteous people would suddenly be made righteous, that God Almighty, the sovereign monarch of eternity, who's made his decision in chapter eight, would like him to change it and add a few more. I mean, come on, you can't do that. The, the people that he's praying about and is concerned about, and I believe it's the Holy Spirit's concern, are God's people. Most of God's people today are not delivered. That is, saved. Sozo is the word. Saved means delivered, not redeemed. And I, I am, I continue to be astounded as I talk 
to those who profess to be Christians how little that they understand of the finished work of Christ and how much of the burden of redemption that they've assumed to be their own. I challenge you to make this verse say that he wants some whom God had not predestinated to be predestinated. Not true. God Almighty doesn't change his mind. The Lord God, God changed not. He's talking here, folks, about righteous people who are not saved. The problem I have is that Christians tell me by the score that to take the position that I've just taken, and you are to examine the scriptures daily to see whether or not what Steve says be true. People have said, well, because of your position, there's no missionary zeal. Well, is missionary zeal based upon the fact that someone may go to hell if you don't intervene? Or is missionary zeal based upon your love for Christ? If you had someone you love very dearly, like Christ loves you, I, I, I don't believe any human has ever known that depth of love, but if you had someone that you love very, very dearly, and you knew there was good news for them, news that they needed, news that they ought to know, that they needed to hear, wouldn't you want to tell them? I have good news for redeemed people. You're delivered from the law. You're delivered from the conscious guilt of sin. You're delivered from the burden of sin. You're delivered from God's wrath. And I want you to know that. I want you folks to be saved that's i'm talking at least I'm, I'm assuming here that i'm talking to redeemed people i'm talking to redeemed people and i want you to be saved not redeemed you're already redeemed i want you to be delivered i want you to be saved that's my heart's desire so it's not only it's it's not only really Paul's desire that we're looking at for his God's people, Israel. It's the Holy Spirit himself, his desire, and it's also mine for you. And it should be yours for others. That's what I'm seeing in the text. And I want you to know that some of our leading evangelists will stand up and scream out to an entire congregation of redeemed people, God's sheep, a whole house full of God's sheep, scaring them into redemption by, by scaring them into redemption by saying that the sword of Damocles is hanging over their head and that God's judgment is about to fall on them. You know, 100 redeemed individuals present and his entire message is, is to that, maybe to that one individual who's not redeemed. While the message of salvation toward those who are redeemed, who need to hear that message, is a message that goes unheard. No wonder so many people go to church and leave on Sunday feeling hungry. They weren't even spoken to. There's no judgment for those of you who are in Christ. And here we are looking at Israelites whom God has redeemed, scratching around in the garbage, trying to earn merit with God. Oh, I want you to see the longing of the heart of the Holy Spirit. My great desire for those people whom I have redeemed is that they be delivered. There isn't good news in this book for any who are not God's people. Folks, the only message in this book for those, the only, the only thing that this book has to say to the non-believer is judgment. But there's fabulous good news in this book for those of you who belong to God. And I see the heart of a loving God saying that the desire of the Holy Spirit's heart is for his people, his people, Israel, that they might be saved. 
And I do not think that you can conclude from verse one that it won't happen. They will be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. The word knowledge there is epigonosco, not according to full knowledge, full experiential knowledge. I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. I don't know how many times over the years I've heard, you know, people say that what, what really counts is, you know, it doesn't matter whether our, our convictions are biblically true or not. You know, don't bore me with all that doctrinal stuff, Steve, you know, or that deep study stuff, Steve, or the Greek stuff. Steve. What matters, what matters is do we have a zeal for God? That, that's all we got to, we just got to have a zeal for God. When people say to me, you know, I just disagree with all of this deep doctrinal stuff. All I need is Jesus Christ. Instantly, they've hit doctrine. Which Jesus Christ? The Jesus Christ of the Jehovah's Witness? Uh, Jesus who is less than God? Is that the Jesus Christ that, that you mean? Or the Jesus Christ of the Muslims who, who didn't die on the cross? Is that the Jesus that you're talking about? Or maybe the Jesus of the Mormons? Even the Jesus of the Romanists? Or the Jesus Christ of Scripture? God of very God, creator of heaven and earth, who holds you in the hollow of his hand, who died in your place. And if he died in your place, what more can you do? How can you stand before God and say, I know you died in my place, but it wasn't enough. You know, I have to, to you know, then add to it. No way. They have a zeal for God. There are many people that have a zeal for God. But here is a verse of scripture that says that sincerity and zeal is not the canon of truth. And it's not according to full knowledge. And you and I have the privilege and the opportunity of carrying that full knowledge, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news to every one of you is Christ died in your place. He was buried and rose from the dead according to the scriptures. Carrying away your sins, he rose physically, literally from the dead as a testimony of the fact, of the truth that the sacrifice that he made was sufficient before God. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. I have great news for you. The good news is that you have to do something. The good news is what Christ did. And they, the Jews, Israel, stumbled over that. And Christians by the score will say, you know, it can't be that that's all there is to it. You're not his child because you decided to be his child. You're not his child because somebody else decided that, you know, for you to be his child. You were born by the will of God. All you have to do is go on the internet and type in born again, and you'll find tens of thousands of, of websites on how to be born again. You know, you come to God and you accept Christ and you'll be born again. So being born again is something that you do contrary to every aspect of birth, contrary to the very illustration of new birth that God gave us. I haven't found one internet site, not one, folks, not one that says that you're born again by the will of God, and it must be there. It's a big, it's a big internet. It must be there. I just haven't found it yet. Somebody ought to know that there's a verse of scripture that says that you're born by the will of God. But what I read is you're born by the will of man, and that is not true. That is absolutely anti-biblical. Their zeal is not according to knowledge. They don't understand what God did for them in Christ. And this was prophesied before. We read in the prophets that they would 
stumble over that stumbling stone. It was a rock of offense. Why offense? Because it offends man's dignity, man's sense of self-worth. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. I, I just, I, I've got to stop right there. Here, here the translators absolutely want you to know that the genitive is to be taken as a simple possessive. God's righteousness. Not a righteousness that they obtained by human works. This is God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted unto the righteousness of God. Now, it intrigues me that, that they, they started out God's righteousness and, and have a, a genitive at the end, the righteousness of God. So they gave you both opportunities there. In both cases, you could translate that God's righteousness, they being ignorant of the God's righteousness, it's articulated, and seeking the word they're seeking, the word means to seek diligently to establish their own righteousness. And you can argue, well, that, that's speaking about Israel, Steve. But, and that's absolutely true of Israel by works of the law. But it is true in the predominant majority of those who profess to be Christians today, who have not submitted themselves under God's righteousness. The word submit here is have not placed themselves under the righteousness of God. Why am I holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight? Because the blood of, of Christ redeemed me because of the blood of Christ, Colossians chapter 1. Why am I righteous? Because of the obedience of Christ, Romans chapter 5, and there's other verses. I've done nothing. I, me, I've done nothing. Therefore, I submit myself, I place myself under the righteousness of God, God's righteousness. And that is totally separate from human effort, totally separate from human works. Verse 4. And man, I could talk about this all day. This one verse has been a, a bedrock truth in my life. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. I think in reading that casually, people have little idea of how much discussion that, that verse has caused. I mean, you could spend, literally spend days, folks, reading profound theological treatments of Romans 10, 4, and 5. In fact, I have some theologians who tell me that Romans 10, 4, and 5 are the most discussed verses in the entire epistle. amazes me there are other verses i'd spend more time on but this is an interesting verse if we simply take that verse at face value and not try and make it fit in into whatever theological persuasion that we have concocted for ourselves that we've acquired for ourselves based upon any presuppositions what that verse says is and it is devastating to the great bulk of modern Christianity that is so wrapped up in legalism is that we were never given a set of stone tablets but a real live person who is the very fulfillment of that law who lives his life in and through us by faith the righteousness based on faith apart from law since we have in fact died to the law in order that we might bear fruit unto God that all righteousness is of the Lord all righteousness is of the Lord that our best is as filthy rags that our affection is to be set on things above Christ and his finished work not not 
beautiful green golf courses and I don't know, really nice bass ponds and you know, all that sort of thing. Christ and his finished work. Not on things below. Not on things below. What, what are the things below? The law and the flesh and the world that we serve in newness of the spirit, not in oldness of the letter. Law. And I could go on and on all day, presenting verse after verse after verse, confirming the marvelous truth that Jesus Christ is our life, not law. Because all the law does, all it's ever done, is show us to be sinners. All the law does is condemn. Folks, I've said it many times, I'll say it again. This book is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life like, like, like it was some computer manual. It is primarily the revelation of the person and the work of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. Until next time, this is Steve. I love you all dearly. I truly do. Thanks for watching.